five, you get 1.6. Mm -hmm. And so everything, every measurement between Earth and Venus comes down to this 1.6. Now all the planets have beautiful orbits, they all have patterns, but nobody has this five-pointed star, nobody has this perfect phi ratio the way that Venus does, and that's the number of harmony. So if you take this same sort of, this, this mathematical pattern that you've been talking about, and you run it through a, uh, a and speed it up, you can see an actual flower built, mm -hmm. like you would see mm -hmm. with a spirograph or something right. like that. You can see this, this sort of mundane like quality mm -hmm. of this flower emerge right and that is a beautiful thing and we see it in many different parts of our lives but the fact that it's there and so clearly relevant and mm -hmm. it's just fascinating to see that it was very moving to me when I first saw that when I first saw and really understood the the depth at which Venus does this and earth together we mm -hmm. can't forget earth but right. the Venus earth dance and and some books have called it the kiss of the Sun there was a little book that came out probably when would it have been? Late 90s, early 2000s, uh, called A Little Book of Coincidence. Oh, I've seen Do that. Do you remember yeah, yeah, that? I, I have that. <laughs> Lovely sacred geometry yes, in that of yeah. all the planets. Mm -hmm. And it was he, one of the things he said about Venus, called it the kiss of Venus with this five pointed star, but also, you know, the things they don't teach you in school. And maybe they are now, but I know they didn't teach when I was going to school, but hopefully they are now. Um, some of this geometry, and it, it gets us into the geometry of astrology, because really, if you're working with astrology, aren't you using geometry anyway? All the time. It is, it is the basis, root basis of that, and, and we're going to do another show at some point in time discussing the, the sacred ge uh, geometry quality okay. of this. I love but I think that, what yeah. I love about this mm -hmm. is that when we think of Venus as an archetype in the, in the in the pantheon of astrology, we always recommend, we always refer to the love part or the beauty part. And when you see that sequence and the flower begins to emerge from the geometry of the planet circling around in that 1.6, and we see that image just come up to the future, uh, to, the, to the present, we can totally understand that it is completely about beauty. What mm -hmm. else could it be? It's just, mm -hmm. it symbolizes beauty in itself. Right. And I've seen it, you know, it's more than just the love of one human being for another or falling in love. It right. is that, right. but it's the love of, it's, you know, the Greeks had many, many words for love. I think in English we only have love. To, but, but the Greeks had many different words to describe different kinds of love. But this is an all-encompassing love that um, that inspires a person from inside. It's it's um, inspires them to live their life. It's the most creative part of their life. What gives them joy? Mm. What brings them beauty? And and that love can be the birth of a child. That love can be. Um, you know the service that they're performing in their in their daily life, their work, their career, whatever, right. or to a, another human being. It can be for um, people. Sometimes they're dedicated to a more universal principle: uh, the love of animals, the love of the earth, the love of whatever. It's sort of our reason to be. I mean, it's our raison d'être. It's it's what brings us joy. And through the creativity process, through the creative process, is where we really find our true uh, reason to be. As I said, it's mm -hmm. really where we find our true purpose I think and right it's a great expression and mm -hmm. uh, we all need it and love it and it's great to have it um, it's interesting when this information came to you you had to do quite a bit of research this is a hefty book that you've written here a lot of information in here and so you've you've been able to track points in time when Venus and the Sun hit that sort of like you mentioned earlier that kiss that love kiss right, whatever you call right. It. when they two are aligned that is, a, is considered a Venus star point so mm -hmm. that happens mm -hmm. every 1.6 years you said right the retrograde of Venus happens 1.6 years, and that's the beginning of her cycle. Right. Okay. So we're in it, mm -hmm. you know, every 1.6 years we're in it, and it, she comes to right before the retrograde, uh, if, if your listeners are following retrograde patterns, especially of Venus, towards the last month of that 584 days cycle of Venus, she's ending the last phase and then she's looping into the retrograde and in that loop she's letting go of the last phase and then picking up new material from her kiss with the sun um, and her kiss with earth to the sun they're all three lined up and then then she then her task is to bring that out to to unfold that for the coming 1.6 years so it's kind so of like a birthing time, process yeah exactly Very each maternal. time we're like in that 
So like in the middle of a Venus retrograde, you're, you're really, it's something beautiful that's actually happening. Mm -hmm. It's the go of 1.6 years ago and the beginning of the next 1.6 years, what you might bring into fruition. Right. Or right. focus on in a very, um, you know, committed love, what you would invest in. We call Venus our value systems, mm -hmm. and I think of it as a, a personal investment. We usually invest in what we believe in, what we what we love, what we feel what good we're about. Drawn to, yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think this it's always a good time to to review. I think in the Venus retrograde process, it's always a good time to review uh, what are we invested in, and does it still hold the magic for us that it did? So it, that's true for almost any retrograde. I always think of retrogrades as an opportunity to put the prefix RE in front of whatever you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. So review, reconsider, right. reinvest, right. all those things. The same is true for the, for the Mercury retrogrades, I was referring mm -hmm. to that, or even mm -hmm. the Mars retrogrades mm -hmm. when you take those attributes. But for Venus, it could be a deepening of a relationship. It mm -hmm. could be a reconsideration of, well, maybe we should get married, or maybe we should do this. Or, and it has that sense of optimism and sort of expansiveness about it, which I so love. So you could think of that as renewal, renewal. because I often think Our of Venus word. retrogrades as um, either it's time to really seriously consider letting this relationship go, mm -hmm. or it's a time to renew our commitment renew our vows, renew our contract with one another. Because Venus in the astrological wheel, you know, it rules the second house, the seventh house. So I think it shows up more with second house things like what are my economic ties or my financial commitments in this relationship? And it doesn't even have to be a love relationship. That can be my financial commitments to um, my work life, what I'm invested in, right. um, a house, um, something, your children, whatever, that you might say during the Venus retrograde, the parents might say to the children or vice versa, um, okay, time to renew our contract now, let's see. Um, no, let's well, see how long we want to put this. Uh, but it is relationships because it's seventh house. But it's not always love relationships. It could be whatever you're Friends, invested yeah, into. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it has a certain maternal quality to it, I think. It's a very strong maternal quality because we're talking about relationships. And, and those relationships are all based on our first relationship, which was with our parents, mm -hmm. our mothers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating subject. Mm -hmm. um, when you look back over your own particular life, and before you knew about this particular characteristic of Venus, does it match up with your life and key points and times? Different? Yes, and I wasn't recognizing the point at which it's in in my life, the star point of, of mine, the zodiac sign. I have other planets there and important things in my chart, but I wasn't giving that part of my life enough credit, enough attention, I was basically saying, oh yeah, it's there, but I'll get to that later or something. And once I saw how the Venus star point was there, I have to start using this more. I have to start acknowledging it more because I started realizing, reflecting back on it, that the things that people had always said to me about what they admired in me um, was so directly connected to my Venus star point. It wasn't to my sun or my moon or... It really uh, illuminated that part of your life and it made more sense. It clicked. And I realized, well, yes, I do have talent in that area. I do... Uh, I have been using that all my life and I haven't always been aware that I've been using it. Do you think as a universal sort of statement that Venus does point to that part in everybody's chart? That it points to their talents. Per I study? think most of the people I've looked at, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I mean, so somebody who may be, uh, say, in banking or finance. I mean, they're you would you would think of them perhaps, or maybe I'm not, maybe engineering, something that's a little bit more uh, hard, fast, and sort of you know rigid. Would the creativity of Venus come through in that capacity? I guess, or I mean, I guess what I'm trying I to say. I haven't studied those people as much for mm -hmm. the book. I was really looking at artists and entertainers, musicians because Venus really comes through music and art and creativity that way. Interesting. But I have looked at poli political figures. I think I asked my 
nephews to, to throw in a few important sports figures that they thought were important Which for you would me think because would be I don't know that world. Right, you'd think that would be more Mars oriented. You would, but right. but for instance, I have done Michael Phelps' chart and um, oh, swimmer. some of the Olympic athletes, which I do follow, uh -huh. and tennis, Venus Williams and her sister Serena, Serena, they are stunning examples. Venus Williams and her middle name is Ebony Star. Wow. Venus Ebony Star, which means black star, mm -hmm. Williams, was born on the day of a Venus star point, or Kazemi, okay, or very close to it, re really close to it, and I'm thinking, how did her parents know? that this <laughs> Venus star was happening on the day she was born and what a star she was going to become. And That is amazing because I'm sure her parents, we don't know this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure her parents did not follow astrology. No, <laughs> no. And I actually had somebody in an audience at one of my workshops who would have known um, that culture maybe and how she was raised and would have said, Chances are, no. no. Maybe a grandmother could have been influential in that, but very doubtful that they were following the planets. Yeah, so people who are born with, at these points, these star points, when the Sun and Venus are what's called the Kazemi. Can you explain the Kazemi real quickly for people? And yeah, so when a planet gets within 10 degrees of the Sun, it's called combust, mm -hmm. which means that the Sun's light is so bright, it kind of burns out the rays of the other planets, so okay. they, they're not felt as strongly. Mm -hmm. I actually have a little problem with that theory, because I actually think the closer a planet gets to the Sun, the more it, it, it wants to express it itself. Bright, brightens, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and in the shining, the sun is actually shining on it. Right, kind and of so giving way. it an extra boost. Right, its right. Its influence is greater. So I've seen that myself. Mm -hmm. But when it moves into a quarter of a degree, like within 15 minutes of arc, it's that's called very Kazemi, mm -hmm. C-A-Z-I-M-I. That's an Arabic word from our great body of astrology that came from Arabic astrologers. When, you know, when Europe was in the dark ages, um, Arabic astrology and mathematics and, and science and astronomy were, were just off the charts. They were making a lot of discoveries and working with a lot of different principles that we still use today in math and science and astronomy and astrology so and navigation and all of that. But um, they, so it's an Arabic word called Kazimi, and I love to say it. I just think it's, <laughs> it's got a nice like ring to it, yeah. Kazimi. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, that's, that's when it's so close. And one person explained it this way when a, sun, when a planet is combust, the, the sun is like the king. And when a planet is combust, you're just in the court of the king. You may be in the same room, but nobody's looking at you because they're all looking at the king, right? Right. But when you're Kazemi, the king has singled you out, called you up, you're sitting right next to him, or you're actually sitting on his lap or whatever, and then all eyes are on you. Then all the attention is on you because you are right there in the sun. Another example besides Venus, Ebony Star Williams, born on or near the Kazemi, is Oprah Winfrey. Ah, you mentioned her. Yeah, that's a fascinating story. Aquarius star. Now, uh, Venus was the Gemini star. Venus Williams is the Gemini star. Mm -hmm. And that takes, for tennis, that makes sense. It takes a lot of agility, flexibility. Quick um, thinking. Strength, quick, quick, you know. That's very This Gemini way, that like, way, yeah. you know, like movements, you know, all of that. And her sister's an Aries star point. Okay, that makes and sense. And they're both, they're, that's action and getting things done. And, and, and her sister, Serena, is more slam dunk, yes, you know, exactly. and really more of a hard-hitting kind of Aries, but but it's funny because the Gemini constellation is the twins, and I've noticed more Gemini star points having a sibling, a real s important relationship with the sibling. And they definitely have that relationship, especially mm -hmm. to be two professional tennis players in the same family is just phenomenal, I think. And what are the odds of that? Yeah, I know, and to well, be so successful. Yeah, and it's the same with Oprah. But what Oprah are the really odds of a me. poor black girl, child, growing up in the South with not that much advantage or opportunity. Actually, many things stacked against her, probably. Coming to be the queen, pretty much, of the world of the, you know, she's broken every record for 
Um, and she's I know known they by, her name, by her name, by her yeah, single name. Exactly. Oprah. Everybody knows Oprah. Oprah, yeah. yeah. And so she was born in this, under this alignment. And on so an exact Kazemi, in Aquarius. In Aquarius. So she carries a real strong um, uh, messenger card. She's so the she, voice. She's the voice. She's right. the voice. And for the globe. And, and the airwaves. The, yeah, yeah. the airwaves, of course. Very and Aquarian. I've always called her, you know, the queen of the airwaves. Yeah. And then seeing that Kazemi operate so purely and so sort of naturally, this is what I mean. You couldn't try to be Oprah. I mean, if you studied your whole life and did everything she's done, you couldn't possibly be what she is because she's got that quality of that Kazemi built into her of Venus, Venus shining through so strongly that there is such a magnetism, there is such an aura that radiates that you can't possibly deny. It's part of her demeanor and she just carries and I love what she's done for literature and authors and bringing the books back into mm -hmm. the world and helping right. people who, you know, literature in, the, in our day and times is, is, is at risk in some ways right. uh, for some people, but for her to bring that back and for her to have this presence and this very optimistic sort of lo large global view of the world and how to empower people and make your lives better and she's been very much involved in Eastern religions and Eastern philosophies and really incorporating that. Mm -hmm. She's been a real, real champion. And she has this Kazemi. She was born at the Born Kazemi. with it, yeah. Are there other people that come to mind who have a similar... Well, I was going to mention Michael Phelps Michael in the Phelps, sports yeah. world. He's been decorated more than anyone else as an Olympian athlete. And he's he has an airy star point in an exact exact square to Aries ruling planet Mars. Oh, so there's the drive. And Mars is up in the 10th of career and profession, conjunct his sun in Cancer. And what I find interesting about that is Cancer's a water, water sign, sign, so he's a swimmer. Swimmer, right. Okay, and, he's got Mars and fast. He's yeah. a fast swimmer. He moves fast through water, and he's been decorated for it 17 times. Yeah, I broke all records. So he's a perfect example. That shows that shows the Mars energy, the sort of the mm -hmm. athletic drive, mm -hmm. combined with the Cancer water Water exactly vehicle right and then he has this wonderful thing and he also has that same thing so this is sort of a, a kiss that people receive and they're it's born a big time. kiss yeah. when Venus kisses you like that don't ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. I think it's just such an amazing topic when you think about it. Because, uh, and then when you see this, or anybody who's born with this at this point in time, so this would people would, who would be born um, anytime the sun, and there are specific dates when the two are aligned, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. those are you can track mm -hmm. through an ephemeral. Exactly, or, and it's in the book, all mm -hmm. the dates. You can look up your own star date. And yeah. Of course, everybody wants to know their own star point and how that works for them. Of course. We're not always born on or near the Kazemis. Um, I'm not, but I'm still using my star point in a in a very powerful way. And when you way. know that point, you can recognize it. You can mm -hmm. see the transits of the planets uh, uh, touching it, and you can see events unfolding, and you know that it's 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 opportune time mm -hmm. to be artistic mm -hmm. or whatever expression. Mm -hmm. so, mm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. So. You know, it's it's just I mean, and more keeps coming out of it. Mm -hmm. This this whole star. Um, mechanism of right. Venus. I don't know if your viewers, if, if this is going to show up on the camera, but I'm going to show this graphic and maybe they can see it, maybe they can't. Mm -hmm. But this is a perfect example of the five signs that it's in right now. The transiting signs are Aries, Capricorn, Scorpio, Leo, and Gemini. And then certain degrees within those signs. So if they're, if any of those five signs are actually prominent in your chart and you know that you're you're getting influenced by the current transiting Venus star interesting so there really is a lot to be said for and it's, an, it's a whole new data point there's you know it's, this is sort of not what we would consider traditional astrology the people who are who have just a little bit of knowledge about this but it's incredibly valuable I think for planning and knowing when this is going to be impacting your life and when you do a typical reading you will give people their Venus star points and so they can be a, a cognizant of them and it's a special reading just for that. I now begin and end all my sessions with the Venus star, and sometimes we don't even get to the rest of the planets 